to get started. Um, so I'm sure it's not going to make you hyperventilate like it made me hyperventilate, but we got four weeks before our exam. So um, we're going to, hi Alyssa, I'm glad you're back. Um, we're going to fly through the rest of these four weeks. The positive thing for you is that the homework gets a little bit less of a load because I don't feel the need because the information should be fresh in the front part of your brain when you get ready to take the exam. Um, so there won't be quite as much homework, um, relatively speaking. Uh, but we will start sliding in some um, review things. I mentioned, I think, on Thursday and Friday about using Wednesdays at 2 o'clock to begin some kind of extra review. Those of you that want to show up, I will have stuff for you to do. I will um, be in the background facilitating. Uh, and if there are any of you that want to stay after school on any days to review that I will participate with you in, I will be more than happy to do that. Uh, and the only caveat, the only part of that is I don't do that for bonus. So uh, you need to do it because you want to perform well on the exam. You know that your areas of weakness um, and uh, making sure that you feel comf confident in that material. I can tell you that there's always something about the American Revolution. Uh, there can't not be, whether it's uh, short answer questions, uh, I doubt if it's a DBQ because there was one just about three years ago, or if there is on the long essay. What always happens about that um, writing question about the American Revolution is it makes you do something different, like not necessarily information about the um, American Revolution. I think the one two years ago that stumped a lot of people, uh, it asked, about a change in British ideals. And so if you just wrote about the American Revolution and you didn't focus that, did anything become truly American? Which the answer is no, um, you missed that. So when we look at that American Revolution, you need to make sure it's not just, do I know stuff about the American Revolution? Do I intensely know stuff that I can respond across a wide branch of, uh, prompts and details. The other one that gets a lot is obviously the civil rights movement, but not again in a way that becomes easy to answer. It makes you do different things. So we spend two days on that civil rights movement and getting ready uh, for that. The other thing that we're going to have to fly through really quickly that comes up a lot is the Cold War. So we'll do that as well. These last three weeks are going to look really different than what we normally do because we won't set out the same, like the big notes things. And I'll have the notes, but because we need to concentrate on specific topics, we're going to do that a little bit differently. Yes, Sophie. Okay, are we going to write one here? Yeah, we'll write that. That'll okay. be another day. Then, but that, to me, that is not that big of a deal. What is this? Just like it's just an essay. And we don't have any documents nope. in the it's just an essay and a prompt. And again, you get a choice of three. So okay. hopefully in that three, you know something. And it's just a regular old essay. Okay. And any class? Yeah, we will. We're going to, we'll do one in class. We'll just for the, the timing of it. But yes, we will do one. And then you'll have it on Wednesday, right? That's yes. Okay. Wednesday, we can practice again. Yes. So will we have access to like the multiple choice questions while we're writing? Or nope. Do we have, uh, nope. Nope. You do not have that. Um, and we can go through that really quickly. Um, I, I always think that I have done this, but I'll go through the whole exam day really quickly. Um, the exam day is divided into two parts, and you get a 10-minute break in between the two parts. In that 10-minute break, I will have a, a snack and watering station for you because I can't see you. You can't come see me. I can't come see you. I think that we are taking the exam in the sack. Um, and at this point, 
I, since we have to spread out anyway, my thought process is to put one of you at a table. So you're by yourself. You don't have people on either end. I spend a lot of time when I have to have people close to each other, trying to keep my fidgeters away from my early finishers that sleep, that freak out the other people. But if everybody has their own table, everybody's spread out. They're not bothered by tapping or movement or any of those things. It starts with the multiple choice. That's 55 minutes. Um, and then when you're done with that, you'll close that up. Uh, you'll put, I forget that you guys haven't taken, you'll put um, like a, a circle sticker steel seal on that and then sign your initials. And then that will get picked up by Mr. Listman. I'm just going to say Mr. Listman. Then you'll get the short answer booklet. All of this is covered in cellophane. Those of you that have a great love of our earth, you will have a hard day that day because you're going to have plastic and leftover paper and all this stuff that just gets thrown away. So you'll open those books there in cellophane. You'll take that SAQ at that time. Um, and then when that's over, same thing, you'll put a seal on that booklet. You know all those booklets that I show you that are open? That's what you'll put the seal on that booklet, sign your name, pass that forward. Then you'll get your 10-minute break, uh, and I will have water. I'll have, um, I hope I can find those little baby bananas again, because those are perfect. Um, little baby um, halos. I'll have fruit snacks, little fruit little smiles that Walmart sells, sells and then granola bars. I know a lot of you don't like to waste food, but I would feel better if you took three bites of a banana or eat half because you only got 10 minutes. You got to go to the bathroom, all that other stuff. Then you go back and then you get the booklet that has the DBQ and the LAQ. And then you'll write that for the last hour and a half. And then you should be done. Uh, usually you're done about 12, 15, 12, 30. What takes time away is all that collection material, right? After everything, it has to be collected, just like all other standardized tests. Mr. Listman has to read the whole thing, so um, it does take longer. And then uh, we will meet down in the commons, and those of you that have given a permission slip, then we go and eat someplace of your choice. So we'll we'll decide where we're going to eat. What? what you haven't gotten it yet. Oh. <laughs> I haven't given like it to you yet. Um, but we'll decide. We have to decide where we're going to eat before I do the permission slip. So we'll decide where we're going to eat for lunch. And then you guys will be back for sixth and seventh hour. I, again, unless you have sports, if, if you don't have uh, sports or a game or anything on that day, I would highly recommend, especially since we don't have any issues of attendance this year, just go home because your brain will be mush. It will really be mush. Yes, Rocco. Uh, what are we going to do like after the rest of the year? Nothing. We don't do anything in this class. Chill. Yep. I offer you bonus for those of you because we don't do a project this nine weeks and you'll it will be reflected. And then the fact that we aren't going to do a lot of homework. So most of you will need the bonus. Uh, but I give it to you at the beginning. I'll give it to you that next Monday and you have three weeks to finish it. So we'll be finished. Our last day of class in here will be um, May 6th, and that will be it. We don't do anything after May 6th. Yes. Um, everybody always wants, everybody always says watch movies, but then everybody's doing work because you're going to have all this stuff for your other classes. Mrs. Hollis has a semester. You guys have another, don't you guys have another project in her class? Everybody wants to watch movies, and I don't mind putting movies in. But usually what ends up happening is you do work for other classes. But that's, I guess I know, Randy. We, we could do that. All right. Does that help a lot? Yes. I think it's May 7th. I think. It's May 7th at 8 o'clock. All right. So let's get back in our notes. We're on page two and three looking at Hoover's scandalous teapot dome um and the um on the top of page three where harding is going to die in office so he's going to be yes did you have, it's on a friday yes um harding's gonna die and then coolidge becomes uh president 
We do have a couple of talented members of Harding's cabinet, not very many of them. Mellon is secretary of treasury. Um, he lowers the national debt and he taxes the wealthy. Herbert Hoover, who will eventually become um, president, he is a progressive. Again, remember being a progressive is not a political party. Um, Okay, so here's where we are getting ready to spend the next 10 years. And it is very important to make this association. And it's very important to see where this association ends up. So on page three, under D, number one, conservatives believed the role of government was to make business profitable. So we are now switching from a government that responds to the needs of the people to a government that says business needs to be profitable. If you're looking, it's the 1920s politics and the Great Depression. That's where we're looking. And at the top, look for um, on page three where it says Harding died. Um, so what happens next is an economic theory that gets tried time and time and time again, this is, this is where we learn history so it doesn't repeat itself. It repeats itself with the same outcome every time. Every time. It's called trickle-down economics. These guys do it, we end up in a Great Depression. President Reagan does it, we end up in another Great Depression. Every time Republicans try trickle down theory, it always ends up in an economic depression or a recession. Always, always, always. Because let's see if we can figure this out as really smart juniors. We're gonna make all of us in this classroom wealthy. We own Amazon, we own Delta Airlines, we own the um, Los Angeles Lakers, we own the Green Bay Packers. Tesla. What? Disney, we own Tesla. Disney. Tesla. What? Tesla. I don't wanna own Tesla. No, thank you. <laughs> Nobody wants to own Tesla. All right, so all of us, all of us are very wealthy, right? We own all of those businesses. The government now says to you, we're going to cut your taxes on your corporation. So you use the money that you save on taxes to trickle it down to your employees so that you can pay your employees better, that you offer them more incentives. How many of you are doing that? None. No one does that. How do rich people get rich? Yes, they keep their money. Did you say stingy? Yeah, they're stingy. They're stingy. Even our people that have gave money away. Let's go back to Andrew Carnegie. He gave away a lot of money, but in order to give away all that money, he had to do what? Be stingy. He had to hold all that money in. Don't you get tax write-offs too? You get all kinds of things. All kinds of things. Currently in our country, just all of you are, you should be getting ready to fill out income tax and you've paid income tax. FedEx paid zero. They paid no money. Amazon paid no income tax. I'm getting ready. I'm just being personal. I'm getting ready to write a $3,000 check to the state of Indiana for my husband's and our income tax. I got to pay more income tax than Amazon. It doesn't work. And if you can understand that, that's why trickle down economics doesn't work. The idea again is that it's going to trickle down. Advocate of treasurer Andrew Mellon, who favored rapid expansion of capital investment. This, that's the other part that they say you will invest in things. Typically what people do is they invest in stuff for themselves, like a new yacht or a new house, and it does help the economy. That part it really does, but not the amount that it makes up in the taxes that they collect. Because when Amazon doesn't pay their one million in taxes, it has to come from somewhere else. And so who does it come from? It comes from us. 
It comes from the working people, and that's going to always be the problem. Um, the premise is high taxes force investors to invest in tax exempt, smaller net return, and this idea about tax cuts. Please take note that in 10 years, we are about to have the worst depression, I hope, in the history of the whole entire world, not just the United States and the whole entire world. Um, we're going to uh, impose higher tariffs on um, those things coming from Europe. And at the bottom of page three, the impact will be that Europe will not recover from World War I. Europe is not going to recover. We don't make it easy. Uh, this, again, the importance of this and why you need to know this is if we're doing a compare and contrast of what happens after World War I versus what happens after World War II, we learn that we cannot leave Europe destitute. We have to fix it. And so after World War I, the United States offers no help. After World War II, we offer the Marshall Plan and we practically rebuild Europe, which is why for the most part, Europe is our friend, right? Because we rebuilt, we spent scads of money in Europe after World War II because we didn't after World War I and in 15 short years, we're back at war. And that's what we learned. And that's what, again, uh, the United States role in uh, the governing world becomes much more better after World War II. On the top of page four, government, government's role is to stay out of business. And again, for the most part, that is true. We are going to start regulating types of businesses, but less government regulation, um, government help to facilitate monopolies and conduct consolidation of industry. So we go back to those monopolies again. And look at page four, number four. Businessmen should run the government. And we're going to try that experiment for 10 years. And again, it should not be lost on you that we're going to explode with the Great Depression. Cabinet positions went to wealthy business leaders who looked out for big business interest, most specifically big business interest for themselves, which is a normal stretch to do um, and shouldn't be that um, hard to, to believe. Look at number five, rejected federal government programs to help ordinary systems or systems, citizens, I'm sorry, to the Mississippi flood victims. The government is not an insurer of citizens against the hazard of the element. Many conservatives believe local communities and charities should take that responsibility. And this is again, what leads us to the great depression. It is why our government now responds with things like stimulus checks, because we tried that the first time with this great depression and it blew up. It blew up. And so that is the hindsight that we get from this Great Depression in which 25%, just as a, as a point of reference, we freak out when we get to 10% unemployment, 12% unemployment. I think that was where at the height that we were at in the pandemic, and we knew why we had that, right? We understood that Lots of places, especially service industries, their people got fired or laid off. We were only at about 12%. In the Great Depression, 25% of the population were unemployed. 25%. One in four people. That is unheard of. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And it is a result of these policies that government's not here to help you government's not here to help you out and it's the reason why president hoover gets the big blame for not doing anything at all um, um on the top of page five it should not come as any surprise that this uh, administration for the next 10 years is going to be hostile to unions uh, they are going to work to associate unions with communism. That will be the connection. And again, we're at a point in time that anytime you say the word communism, it's an immediate shutdown. 1919, the Soviet uh, Russia now becomes a communist nation and we are terrified. 
rightfully so, remember those things that we are afraid of, a violent overthrow of a capitalist nation and that they're atheist. And so we have tons and tons of immigrants coming from Russia to get away from their uh, revolution and what dissolves into a civil war in Russia. We have lots of especially Russian Jews coming and we are very fearful of them. And so that to us in the United States, unions are kind of a thing like that. Um, reducing the national debt by making government smaller. Again, we do work on reducing the debt. Next, Coolidge is going to be uh, finish out Harding's uh, presidency, and he is also going to be elected president in his own right. And the very first thing that knocks on the door that says there are problems big economic problems in our country is farming. So we call it the farm problem. And this is for those of you, I don't know that you probably have any relatives old enough to have lived through the Great Depression um, because they would be pushing 100 at this point. But people that live through the Great Depression in rural areas had no clue that there was a Great Depression because they had already been hit 10 years before that with this farming issue. Um, what happens is Europe starts growing their own food again. And at no point did American farmers say, oh, we should stop growing so much food, right? They just kept growing the same amount. And so what happens, instead of them being able to sell to all these European countries, there's a glut on the market. And when you make too much of something, it doesn't matter what it is, the price goes down. Now, if you're a factory owner, you can probably handle that. But if you're a farmer and you live on margins that are so narrow, you are going to be the first to go bust. So what happens again is the depression will hit the agriculture sector in the 1920s and 25% of farms will be sold off. So we're already starting this before we get to the Great Depression. Um, so we try to fix it. We try to get agriculture it, with the McNary uh, uh, Haugen bill. Government losses would be made up by a special tax. Coolidge is going to veto it twice. So as a result, it doesn't go forward. Why does Coolidge veto it? Because he's a businessman and he doesn't understand the way farming works. And so when he vetoes that, that goes away. That is why Farmers now have subsidies, and that is why people who don't understand farming don't get subsidies. Had to explain it to my husband. Why in the world would we give away government money to have farmers not farm? And my response is, do you want to pay $2 for a loaf of bread, or do you want to pay $10? Whichever one. I would rather pay two and give farmers some subsidies so they don't grow on that ground. So they do practice good, safe farming techniques. That's what governments do. That's what we're trying to do. But the business part of this, these administrations shut it down because just like to my husband, that doesn't make sense. You're going to pay people not to work. Not happening. That gets us in trouble. Um, the election of 1924, again, Republicans get Coolidge. Um, Democrats nominated conservative businessman um, John W. Davis. Party is going to be split between Rhett and Dries. Again, fundamentalists, modernists, liberals, white supremacists, immigrants, WASP. Try to condemn the KKK, but they can't. And we'll see that again. Um, and what happens is the Democratic Party splits in two. And so we know automatically when it's the Democratic splits in two, the other candidate's going to win. And Coolidge is going to defeat both Davis and uh, Laf uh, Lafayette. Um, and uh, nation too prosperous to be concerned with reform. Like everybody is making money. Everybody is making money in the stock market. The middle of page six is something that I always have and try to find a weird spot to put this. Uh, it's Muscle Shoals, which those of you that are familiar with Leonard Skinner 
there's a line, Most Little Shoals, in one of those Leonard Skinner songs. But it's a place. And the significance of Muscle Shoals is the Tennessee River Valley Authority. And what happens with the TVA is the beginning of public works or dams. So if you've ever been in and around that area and you're going around the mountains and you're going to pass that Tennessee River like 800 times. Oh, there's Tennessee River again. Oh, there's Tennessee River again. Oh, there it is again. It comes from... Uh, this dam project, which is still a vital part of that area. Uh, I would guesstimate that the TVA employs uh, probably is the largest employer in Tennessee. Um, it is a, a really important part and it'll be a very important part when we get to um, uh, the New Deal. So conservative politics is halt, higher tariffs, anti-union, laissez-faire, trickle down. It's one of my few little acronyms that's good because it halts everything. All progressive stops, no more progressive reforms, no more caring, no more response to uh, the needs of the people. And we are now all about um, helping business. The second part of politics in the 1920s that's really important is this big giant word, isolationism. We are now going to isolate ourselves from the rest of the world. This is the part of the roaring 20s that are, is essential to understand why these people are not having a fun time. These people are living as if there's no tomorrow, which I know that sounds like an awesome thing, but it really means these people have given up hope. We have gone through a war, and even the United States was not in that war even for a year, but we have put men in a place of a war for really no reason. There was nothing that was happening, good or bad. We killed millions of people with our industrial technology, and now the United States says, we don't ever want to do that again. We're going to isolate ourselves and we're going to keep out of the rest of the world. We do not join the League of Nations. We are not going to be allies with anyone. We're not going to come to the aid of anyone. We did that and it drug us into this horrible war known as the Great War. Because right now it's still just the Great War because we don't have a second one. We truly believe that we can commit to never having war again. And so on page seven, there's this big giant, and just make sure you don't need to know all the ins and outs of this five power, four power, nine power. What you need to know about the Washington Disarmament Conference is that's what it's about. It is a threat to peace. That big giant Navy that we built, we need to make sure nobody else has one that big. And so the United States... Great Britain and Japan. It's going to come back and haunt us that we include Japan in this. So what we say is we are going to put a number on how many ships countries can have. These are arms treaties. And countries sign that and say we are only going to have this many and you are only going to have this many. And so at the beginning for the five power is 553. Five, United States and Great Britain get five battleships, Japan three. Italy and France, 1.75. So they gotta wait every year, they're only gonna get one. And then they gotta add up those 7.5 so they get another. Building of new battleships banned for 10 years. Then we go to a four power. We add France in that one. And then finally we end up with a nine power. It doesn't matter which one you look at. All you need to know from these is that it's limiting the power. So, loopholes. No restriction on small. And what do you do if they build more? Because Japan's going to build more. This is what's called an honor system, right? An honor system. United States is going to follow the rules. 
surprisingly so, very few other countries are going to follow those rules. On the top of page eight, we, and I'm not going to read much of this, but we still continue to intervene in the Caribbean and Central America. Troops are going to be in Haiti until 1934. We're going to go into Mexico. Um, we're going to take um, uh, over uh, parts of Mexican oil fields. And at the bottom of page eight, this is where we begin our look at how we get into the Great Depression. We are going to start loaning money to Europe. And we're going to start loaning them a lot of money, Germany especially. Germany has to pay back all this money to France. They don't have any money. They don't have an economy. Everything has been destroyed. So they have to rebuild, and so we start borrowing. At the bottom of page 8, France and Great Britain demanded German make enormous reparations, about $32 billion. That's in 1920 money, $32 billion. So if you look at the top of page 9, in 1923, in Berlin, a loaf of bread was 120 million marks. Yeah. People pushing wheelbarrows to the grocery store full of money. It's worthless. It's pointless. And guess what? We keep adding money to it. So the Dawes Plan of 1924 rescheduled their reparations and opened the way for further American private loans. We still keep loaning money. My Judge Judy fans, anybody watch Judge Judy with great regularity? If you do, you know what she always says to those dumb girlfriends, and I'm talking to you girls, who are all put together and have great jobs, and you got your own apartments and your own houses and your own cars, and for some reason you continue to attract guys that don't pay for anything. And you loan them money, 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 and then you break up, and then you want all your money back. And Judge Judy says, the first time, did he pay you back? No. Second time, did he pay you back? Third time, did he pay you back? Fourth time, did he pay you back? Then why'd you keep loaning them money? And guess what? She doesn't give them their money back. Note to self, girls. And I'm sorry, guys. I'm not talking about any of you in the room. But note to self, girls. There are men that prowl for those kind of women that have their act together and have money and they're the fun kind of guy that just kind of bums around and they're cool and they're using you for your money because you got your stuff together. Don't loan them money. But, because I know you guys would never do that. So, the United States keeps loaning money and keeps loaning money and keeps loaning money and keeps loaning money. What can you do to Germany if Germany doesn't pay it back? How many of you have a car note that you pay or that you're responsible for? If you have a car note that you're responsible for and you don't pay your car note, what's gonna happen to your car? It gets repossessed, right? In the middle of the night, some guy's gonna come with a, with a tow truck and take your car and the bank's gonna sell the car to recoup your money and you've just lost all your money. What are you going to do to Germany if they don't pay it back? You can't swoop over in the middle of the night and take something. There is no way to do that. And so these are the beginning steps, again, of what's going to lead us into the um, Great Depression. Okay, we'll end up on my most, most favorite, favorite, favorite thing about this time. It is called the Kellogg Brand Pact. I love this so much. It's drafted by the United States and France. Growing unrest in Europe due to slumping economy, Japan's aggressive moves. We're going to make a pact that war is illegal. See why I love this so much? It's illegal. War is illegal. 62 nations are going to sign this. 62 nations are going to sign this pact that says war is illegal. Except for defensive. And I hope you understand and you already figured out point number four, major flaw, no enforcement. 
Zero enforcement. And here's going to be the problem. 61 of those nations are going to follow this. The one that doesn't is going to be Japan. Hmm. 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 We in this course focus on Japan at this point for World War II more than we focus on Europe because we enter World War II because of the attack by Japan. But that's what's going to happen. Two causes for failure of peace, Great Depression, war psychosis. So, yeah. Let's just make war illegal. It's my favorite. My favorite.